Well, I, th I think we're, f we're fortunate, firstly, in having so many people come for this session. Uh, and it, uh, it follows on from a number of things that we've been trying to do this year in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the archive, which was set up here in 1985. And the last seminar discussion that we had was looking at the role of the archive and the, the actual use and uses that the archive was put to and how evidence was used. And Neil Walton from Goldsmiths College spoke a little bit towards that, as did Eileen Adams, who is an education researcher. Um, and she gave a particular slant to that topic. Um, I've prepared some packs for everybody today. I hope I've got enough to go round. If not, there might just be some sharing between couples. Um, and I've put a summary of Eileen's paper in there, along with other things to do with the archive and to do with Mary Martin Thomas. So there's some background information, background material, as well as part of the packs. Um, so in framing our discussion today with Sharon and with Janine, um, we've got a, a particular focus, and you've seen from the leaflet that the focus is art school educated. And that in itself will raise all sorts of questions. I hope it will raise all sorts of questions today. Um, because what we've got effectively is, I think, an opportunity to look at teaching and learning and training in art and design as well across uh, the 1920s and 2016. Um, so the dialogue that we've got today, I think, should support some other thoughts and other, other discussions and extend the debate that we've got spanning the 20th into the 21st century. Um, and I'll be interested to see sort of how Leeds College of Art curriculum works at the moment because I don't actually have much of a sense of that because I haven't spoken at any real length to Janine or Sharon for some time. But we'll, we'll, we'll pick up on that. Um, it's fair to say, I think, that the period that we're looking at and the, the difficulty I have and the complexity there is in placing Mary Martin Thomas in the period in which the exhibition is placed is that there are any number of influences that would have informed her, her training. And it's a training which brought together not just the notion of teaching but instruction as well as the development of skills and understanding as well. So I've set myself the task this afternoon in 30 minutes or less to, to try and do that. Um, so we've got a brief historical framework of the development of art across the, the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. Look at Mary Martin Thomas as a case study, as a particular case study, and then very briefly put the role of the NAEA, all of this, into a context for further development and further research. Um, so let's hope that uh, that, that triggers off a, a few thoughts. Um, where to start? Well, I'll start, as I have done with previous conversations, with a comment from a recently departed colleague, Keith Walker, from Manchester Metropolitan University, who used to run the postgraduate course there and used to bring his postgrads here to have a study day with us. And he expressed a concern some time ago about the degree of his student trainees' knowledge. And the phrase he used was, it's not what they don't know that's such a concern, but that more the fact that they don't know what they don't know. And that in itself sets, as it were, a question for us if we're looking at art school educated today as part of our brief. It's what do students know and what is it that would become part of their expectations and part of the provision for students in training today compared 
to the way that, say, Mary Martin Thomas was trained in the late 1920s. Um, I just picked up because I, I went up to the Parkinson Building at Leeds University and uh, just picked up, you know, Morris de Summeray's mm. catalogue from a recent exhibition up there, which was very useful. And Peter Kennard, who was a former student of Morris de Summeray, um, has just written a li an interesting little piece in, in there. And uh, it's worth quoting. He says, I know how lucky I was to be taught by him, de Summeray, at the beginning of my life as an artist and how he deeply influenced my understanding of what art could be. He taught that you could work against the grain of fashion and that thinking must go hand in hand with deep investigation of the materials and processes of making art. He taught that art history is not a distant thing to be learnt by rote and that artists in the past are as much part of one's community as one's contemporaries. And that in itself sort of linked directly to some of the expectations and some of the provision that was in place at the time when Mary Martin Thomas was being taught and instructed. And there's a fine balance to be struck between the two. So that deep investigation of uh, using materials and processes in the making of art, I think, is important um, to her experience in the 1920s. Um, but I think Kennard was also pointing out the underlying belief that art history is part of one's community. And what's interesting in that sense, because we're fortunate in having Mary Martin Thomas's um, syllabus for her secondary teacher's drawing certificate, which is on display downstairs as well. But I was just looking at the actual accompanying sheet, which outlined the reading list, if you like, for her particular certificate and I, I won't go through the titles that would be too onerous but I'll just break it down into numbers in terms of design and lettering there were seven references in terms of plant drawing one in terms of anatomy two drawing generally two geometrical drawing two perspective three history of art and architecture 17 and it's quite interesting in terms of a, you know, a reading list for students of that particular period to note that that would be part of the expectation of the course at that time, that they should address some of those um, as particular sources. So um, <laughs> the title of our session then, Art School Educated, as with the title that we've got downstairs, Mary Martin Thomas, a a classical art education I, I think they should both come with a question mark but we'll have to leave the question marks hovering I think because we could say a classical art education yeah and that therefore opens it up into a consideration of what we mean by a classical art education and art school educated you know again what does that mean so if we leave those two question marks hovering then perhaps we can you know talk through some of the implications of that as we as we proceed today. Um, I mean, quite frankly, I mean, if we were talked to, you know, if we do actually, you know, analyze the phrase in depth, art school educated, we could be here for months and probably not arrive at any, any real true consensus, but uh, we'll do what we can with what we've got, which is always the case. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, um, we're ahead of the curve, as they say, because this seminar this afternoon is actually um, preempting a forthcoming symposium, which is at Glasgow School of Art on June the 25th, which is looking at transitions out of fine art education. And two of the questions that they'll be looking at that Glasgow conference will be, what and who is an undergraduate art education? Uh, sorry, what and who is it for? And how are students prepared for life beyond art school? Um, and that actually sort of connects with one or two things that, that I'll be talking about a little bit later on. You may be wondering what this particular piece of metalwork is in, in the middle of the room. Um, well, it's a we'll French... We'll have an auction at the end. <laughs> yes, we'll have an auction at the end. Yeah. Um, all I'll do is refer you to it and ask you from time to time just to have a look. It's, it's pertinent to some of the things that will connect with Mary Martin Thomas's experience. So from time to time, just 
just have a glance and acquaint yourself with that particular uh, a particular sculpture um, okay now part of the dilemma I had when I was thinking about um, starting to look at where Mary Martin Thomas was located in the chronology of um, art education and training was where to start to start with her and work forward 1927 or to start further back and look at some of the influences that actually underpinned the forms of instruction and training that sustained and supported her but so you'll forgive me if in fact I don't do either of those things if I sort of go backwards and forwards hopefully and bring some of those things together as as we proceed um, uh, what I would like to perhaps just start out with is in a sense a report that was located in schools and informed school practice but you can see how it set the tone and the tenor of the day the Haddow report of 1926 which was to do with the education of the adolescent uh, concerned mostly with establishment of modern schools um, at the time uh, with the leaving age then of 15 uh, but it stressed the training of boys and girls to delight in pursuits and rejoice in accomplishments work in music and art work in wood and metals and the craft link is important because you'll see how that connects with other initiatives earlier on leading up to Mary Martin Thomas's actual training so the reference to practical instruction was um, was affirmed in all all particular ways but uh, the emphasis was laid on the artistic aspect of the work through the Haddow report um, and it was particularly associated with the nature of applied art and of course there are examples of Mary Martin Thomas's attention to applied art downstairs in in the exhibition um, interesting enough as well that practical work for girls um, was moved away from a sort of narrow concept of useful needlework um, and it, they were encouraged to and it says as I quote some of the various artistic crafts such as leatherwork bookbinding basketry the staining and painting of white wood whatever that is mm -hmm. stenciling and where conditions are suitable pottery enameling and weaving so that vocabulary of craft skills was part of the expectation of students as a consequence of the Haddow report in schools in 1926 which was the year before Mary Martin Thomas went to art school she would have been if not the direct but the indirect recipient of that form of training which was long in gestation to arrive at that particular point that, that balance between art and craft and design towards a, applied arts um, a, across the piece um, uh, but the most significant suggestion of the Haddow report was that besides the formal class instruction for the recognised art course of and this is the recognised art, art course object drawing, memory drawing geometrical and mechanical drawing and design so art teachers were expected to supervise group work in artistic crafts um, and uh, that in itself was you know a move away from the somewhat restricted aspect of where pupils were directed um, and directed their subjects towards design which at that time consisted of space filling drawing out patterns and occasionally modeling motifs or doing repousse work or something like that um, now again I just want to forgive me if I'm just quoting one or two things from different sources but I think I think it's important that that we do establish establish these um, and this is a quote going back now to just you know the First World War period so sort of 1916 and it's from the School of Arts and Crafts of Battersea Polytechnic 1916 and the aim of that particular institution was to pr produce a complete designer by the converging roads of draftsmanship, the study of colour and the historic styles of ornament and a complete understanding of the technical difficulties involved in the production of workable designs. 
whereas the syllabus for the design school of Manchester School of Art in 1924 had two particular structures, the intermediate or lower school course and then the advanced or upper school course, all of which involved the very terms and conditions that we've just described both from Haddow and from Battersea Polytechnic in 1916. Object and memory drawing, industrial design, drawing from cast and natural forms, history of styles, practice of selected handicrafts, um, anatomy, flower painting, modelling natural forms and architectural drawing amongst other things. Um, but in all of that the, the nature of the experience that was embedded into the system that Mary Martin Thomas would have worked with and through was set up in 1913 by the Board of Education's drawing examinations and they had very distinct categories. There were drawing examinations in life, antique, memory and knowledge, architecture, anatomy and perspective. So clearly delineated aspects in the experience which tied in with the expectations and the zeitgeist of that particular period which was not divorced from industry but was influenced also by the arts and crafts movement the work of William Morris and others um, and led to a redefinition particularly of the way that schools of design and art school syllabuses were actually set up and established and developed over time um, particularly up until say you know, the advent of the influence of the Bauhaus which led to basic design after the Second World War and so on but that's just going a little bit too far for today's brief um, uh, there's an awful lot that we could bring together to discuss at the moment but I am conscious of, of time and I don't want to sort of impinge very much upon Sharon or Janine's time but some of the key influences that need to be borne in mind that are concerned with applied art to design in the late 19th and first half of the 20th century are the relationship between things like the Art Workers Guild, the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, the introduction of crafts to the Royal College of Art, Letherby's influence on the Central School of Art, something called craft education for artisans because terms like that was still very much a potent element of education at the time you know the notion of the artisan um, linked with art craft and trade schools um, design schools creative designs and crafts and art teacher training along with the, you know, the nature of arts and crafts in schools themselves um, there's an awful lot of cross-referencing to the nature of um, the structure of how those courses uh, were established and how they were managed at the time but uh, if I just take a couple of those out of context so that you can see what what the balance is between the provision at the time for example the art crafts and trade schools many principals urged that their primary purpose was the training of worker craftsmen uh, the main structure was planned for general students working for internal diplomas in the Board of Education's examinations. But following the example of the Royal College in 1901, so if we go back that far, local schools divided into departments of design, modelling, painting, with an architecture department. So architecture was very much you know, an intrinsic part of the actual teaching package and expectations of, uh, of students then. Um, the Art Workers Guild, its first purpose, according to Letherby, who set up the Central School of Art at the time, was to establish and reinforce that association of architects with artists and craftsmen. So you know, the very language almost divine, defines the terms of experience. You know, the notion of, of artists, craftsmen, designers and architects. 
having you know almost an equal influence in the nature and training of students is a significant aspect of the conditions that prevailed at the time um, but what else was happening what uh, I mean, what other sort of prevailing influences were there at the time well if I just look more generally and you'll get a sense of how some of the uh, some of the atmosphere uh, of teaching and learning was in a sort of state of flux and it was a dynamic flux because of the advances and shifts in the way that people were thinking about the way children were taught as well as the way that people were thinking about the way students were taught in terms of child art you know the notion and recognition of child art at the time was significant you know based and on you know particular developments in say psychology or the uh, understanding the increasing understanding of primitive art and the growth of modernism in art itself um, the growth of design and design with its roots in you know the German workbunds which were in fact you know the forerunner of the Bauhaus set Weimar and Dessau under Walter Gropius and others and of course the influence of the Bauhaus had a significant impact not least of which at Leeds in the 50s and 60s with Harry Threw, Bron, Victor and Wendy Pasmore, Alan Davy and Tom Hudson and others who established and promoted the basic design continuing process courses which have been so influential for a number of years and certainly toward you know across the second half of the of the 20th century um, but if we just sort of hover a moment with something that Walter Gropius was concerned with and his concern was the notion of integration with industry um, and the only views he, he would not tolerate which were those which separated the artists from contemporary society lest they produce and this is an interesting one an art proletariat lulled into a dream of genius and enmeshed in artistic conceit destined to social misery condemning to a life of fruitless artistic activity social drones useless by virtue of their schooling in the productive life of the nation so we could throw that one in just to stir <laughs> things up a little bit um, and it sort of it sort of brings me around to in a sense um, to just to the use of language particularly then I'll come back to reinforce one of the things that we said about Mary Martin Thomas and it's a question and the nature of how we define the experience of uh, students today and I'll, I'll bow completely to what Janine and Sharon have to say but I've just selected out in terms of language that uh, as it were reflects something of that background from this is from Wolverhampton College of Art from 2009 and these are the statements because I believe students have to make statements now don't they yeah? yeah these are some statements that I've picked out and if anybody can explain to me what these mean I'll be very grateful um, first student the transcendence of marginality is achieved through challenging binary oppositions rethinking the body as a rhizome involved exploring desire as dispersion and acknowledging the importance of fluidity and multiplicity which is based on proliferation I haven't got a clue what that means right. I know it's English because I recognize the words as English but in terms of what it actually says it's something of a mystery to me um, try this one it's a much shorter one you'll be pleased to know an exploration of internal space between two televisions extremely close together and the external space when the televisions are further apart right. I don't quite know what's going on there either or absurd futile creations are constructed from reinstated everyday objects kinetic ethnics fuel the pointless preoccupations of nothingness delectably worthless aesthetics prevail subliminal outcomes 
Now there's, there's a sense here that somehow or other I feel that these students are being done a disservice. Not least of which I think they're certainly doing a disservice to the English language in the way that those phrases are put together to constitute what? And that's another question mark we'll leave hovering as well. Um, there's a copy of that in the pack as is an extract from the Jackdaw article which does a review of the Royal Academy Schools degree show um, and I think you'll find that one interesting because I'll just read you this. Um, being at art school is now to live in a fantasy world. It's the freedom with official sanction to be self-indulgent. Every caprice may be indulged in pursuit of that holy grail self-expression. Learning skills by application such as what happened in the past in these very rooms is anathema. It would be hard work for one thing, and pursuing that course would lead to the inevitable conclusion that some are obviously better than others, and we can't tolerate that now, can we? So, again, there are some controversial points there, and some points that need teasing out. I won't go through all of them, but they do, I think, raise a number of issues and concerns which are pertinent to this discussion and, of course, appropriate for um, for today. So back to Mary Martin Thomas. Um, again, she is something of an enigma. We've, we're fortunate in as much as we've got most of her diploma work from the period when she was at York School of Art from 1927 to 1930 and some other pieces from her contemporaries. What the exhibition downstairs has attempted to do is to put that together with other material from the archive which shows some of the nature of other influences that were in place at the time, such as the work of Marion Richardson um, and other publications to do with the way thinking was being moved and changed because of all of these other influences that were, uh, that were in place, not least of which, of course, will be the shift. And it's a, sometimes it's a very overt shift, sometimes it's a very subtle shift from the nature of design and applied art into other forms of recording and observation um, and that in itself is quite intriguing when you look closely at some of the works that are on display downstairs but the way for example that Marion Richardson's um, writing course and letter formations came out directly as a consequence of these sorts of experiences the way that students would have been trained at that time so pattern making was an underpinning, a fundamental element of the formation of her writing patterns. Um, and that was a, a significant shift. And we've got some examples of that uh, downstairs in one of, the, one of the cabinets. You'll also see some of the examination papers down there that Mary, uh, Mary Martin Thomas took, as well as the descriptors of her course from the secondary teacher's drawing course. And the various groups that from that course that she chose to specialize in having undergone the other formal parts of her instruction while she was at um, at York School of Art. Uh, so what did it mean to be art educated in the late 1920s? Well clearly there were defined skills in a range of crafts and applied and decorative arts there was certainly knowledge of anatomy and botany and architecture as well as the history of art and antique styles. Drawing ability was evident in all areas as were painting skills and there was both a design and technical understanding which was appropriate there as well including geometry and perspective and the use of an informed and functional vocabulary relating to 
all of those different aspects of her course. And it built towards the development of a visual acuity um, based on observation, on memory, on measurement and on discipline. Now, I'll just pause there for a moment. Roger, I just wonder if, um, can I ask you a favour? Yes, you can. Um, could you just stick that bag over that model for me? <laughs> Don't sit over my head. <laughs> over your head. <laughs> I don't think it should just fit. Now, have you tested this? <laughs> yeah, I have. It should just go. You caught this side, or that's it. Thank you. One of the one of the key expectations, as you've probably picked up as we've been talking, as I've been going through some of the structures of uh, of those courses, was the the fact that a key element of Mary Martin Thomas's experience would have been that of memory drawing. You've had chance to look at the model. <laughs> uh, I won't actually sort of you know suggest for one moment that on the piece of paper you've got that you should draw that but you see what the challenge could be and you've got examples downstairs of some of the memory drawings that Mary Martin Thomas did of quite complex architectural pieces so the Ionic Doric Corinthian columns from her architecture course are exquisite and highly detailed but done from memory and those are displayed downstairs as are other examples of the memory drawing course. Now I don't know if any of those elements constitute part of you know, a student's training today, I suspect probably not and I know that I would struggle with that sort of exercise but it was an implicit part of the expectations of students at that time and it was never questioned. There's an accompanying part of the display downstairs which is Professor John Swift's um, draft copy of his doctoral thesis on memory drawing in English education. That in itself is revealing and gives a clear example of just how complex an undertaking that particular element of the course was and the expectations that went with it. Um, so Along with all of that came a national recognition and national qualifications and moving from the ATD, the Art Teachers Diploma, towards an NDD later on from 1953 onwards. Um, and the shift was also a shift of, in emphasis from the content of the course and the control that local regional art colleges had over <coughs> the course to a more, a more recognized nationally structured um, set of provisions and that in itself is a whole area of research which at some point somebody doing an MA or a PhD here would you know like to pursue then clearly we've got all of the evidence all of the information that we need in order to do that. Um, but as far as Mary Martin Thomas is concerned, by 1939, as far as we can deduce, she was an art teacher in Huddersfield. Um, and in 1941, she married the Reverend R.C. Parkinson. So if you see the odd drawing or design downstairs with the name Parkinson on it, you'll know that that was done post her period at York School of Art. But there's a delightful piece of symmetry here. She married the Reverend Parkinson in 1941, who was the son of William Parkinson, who happened to be the principal of York School of Art, who died in 1927, the very year that Mary Martin Thomas went to York School of Art as a student. And I have to thank Les and his contacts for that piece of information because Les has been digging deep to, to get extra biography to do with Mary Martin Thomas and we're piecing together you know, the biography and some of the jigsaw 
um, of that to give it give more of a shape to her life um, so in terms of that um, element of her, her life and her work the, the only thing that I can properly say is that really to get to know her better is only to know her through her work to unpick the enigma can only be based on the evidence that we've got downstairs at the moment until such time as we come up with further biographical details we don't have a photograph of her you know that will be our holy grail is to find a photograph of Mary Martin Thomas um, and even a photograph of York School of Art because my understanding is that it was blitzed during the Second World War and it's now a garden at the back of the art gallery in York but we've got uh, people on the case who will hopefully come up with a photograph or some other information that will sort of help us to consolidate that in due course. Um, now, in a sense, you know, there's so much more that we could cover here this afternoon, but I don't want to confuse you know, the, the issue by adding any more in terms of the nature of legislation that in the shaping of art courses or the close relationship between individuals and the development of ways of thinking whether it's at the Slade whether it's the Central School of Art whether it's the Royal College of Art because they all have a particular influence in the history and development of art education at the time all I will say is that for a more contemporary focus um, particularly after after Hornsey there are some readings here the the David Piper after Hornsey and his publication after um, Coldstream will put a post 1968 complexion on the nature of art teaching in art schools and leading up to more or less where we are at the moment um, but two other and forgive me Sharon Janine if I steal any thunder here I hope I don't but <coughs> these two publications to do with Leeds College of Art behind the mosaic and past into present are two really exceptionally well informed and clearly written studies of one of our best regional art schools Leeds College of Art and Design and its influence um, uh, on art education over over the years um, those two publications are well worth well worth looking at because they do tie together a number of the things that, that uh, you know, I've sort of tried to address um, somewhere this afternoon. Um, I've just flagged up this one, and I'll probably finish with this and pass over to to Sharon and Janine. It's just on page eight. It says some philosophies. Um, the links between fine art and design have been essentially strong, each feeding the other. Design has benefited from an aesthetic and human sensitivity brought to it by fine artists who have in turn responded to the changes within society, their awareness being enhanced by the work of designers. That was part of the philosophy of Leeds College of Art and Design um, by Rebecca Lowe. Um, and of course, there are some illustrious alumni from Leeds who will confirm that through their work, not least of which would be Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore and others. But on the teaching side as well, we mentioned some who were instrumental in setting up and f advancing the basic design course. And it brings me back to the question, or the two question marks, as it were, a classical art education. What does that mean? What did it mean in terms of Mary Martin Thomas? And art educated what does it mean in terms of students then and students today and the 86 year gap we've got between us between her time and the time that Sharon and Janine are going to talk about now may not be as wide as we think but no doubt we'll find out in due course thank you both which is best to follow on, but shall I just go for it? Thank you, Tony. That was really, really interesting. And I hope that 
um, my paper will um, follow on and flow. Um, my talk's called um, The Loss of Curriculum Sovereignty According to an Art School Principle. The source material is mainly from, in this extract from the paper, is mainly from Leeds College of Art Archive. It traces the almost subsuming of Leeds College of Art into the then Polytechnic, which is now the Leeds Beckett University. It resulted um, at the time in the resignation of artist Eric Taylor, who was the then principal of Leeds College of Art from 1956 to 1971. In 1959, in a lecture to the Colleges of Art Conference, Taylor described the findings of his own research into what other schools are doing in the matter of natural progression. Having visited over 20 schools across Europe, he found in the most part a new excitement for plastic values and an immense upheaval. Taylor issued a warning that in this period of technological change, the British schools could be in danger of, quote, losing sight of the real purpose of the art school, which is to make by means within the field of art an increased awareness of and an excitement for plastic values. He closed the lecture with another curious warning, which shows his foresight in predicting that a serious threat to art school sovereignty was afoot. I'll quote, let us hesitate before we rush blindly into enormous factory-like buildings. We teachers have had a great deal of experience in training the young and developing artists, so let us not be sidetracked by those who have no experience whatever in that direction. Three years later, in a paper addressing the annual Association of Art Institutions, at a meeting, Taylor asserted the importance of the experienced teacher artist to art education and the case for a unity of the arts. I'll quote. For when designers, technicians, artists and architects and engineers can understand the same language, then we shall have reached another great age of art education. At the same meeting, there were many reflections upon the report written by the new council headed by Coldstream. The chairman of the association for that year, uh, Mr Philipson, explained that between 1955 and 1957 there was a reduction from 139 to 105 schools allowed to run the NDD courses. More interesting, however, was the figure that he gave for their art schools which were to be given approval for the new diploma course, less than 40. It is worth noting that the objective of the um, association was to promote the efficient organisation and management of art colleges and schools of art to assist the development of art education. Representation from each institution included the principal art teacher. So five years on, Taylor wrote a document that captures his standpoint on the proposal for a polytechnic system and the vital role that the principal of the school plays in the design of a high quality art education. Firstly, he remarked on a lack of understanding by the Department of Education and Science on the nature of the College of Art. He explains how initially he thought the idea of a polytechnic was an imaginative scheme. However, as the details of the scheme were unfolded to him, it became clear that the art school principal was not part of the new structure. For Taylor, this would result in only one thing, the direct route to fragmentation, referring not to the role, but to rather the implications this would have on the wider national art education system. He went on to explain why an experienced principal was vital to the design of art education. Quote, when Summerson first approved the DIP-AD courses, the first detail that had to be submitted was the academic qualifications of the principal his art experience and his industrial experience. Taylor then clarifies that the reason why the coordination of an art school cannot be done by normal administration because of the dynamic nature of the creative industries to which the art school needs to be aligned. Thereby, this required the principal to employ design skills to work intuitively governed by his experience in art. In his view, the polytechnic scheme 
would be the antipathy of unity, particularly as an art school principal was to become merely an assisted role, positioned outside the academic hierarchy. So a year later, in a letter to the press, Taylor presented his views on the then current broader education system, which he said seemed to devalue those that are visual it, and that the GCE gateway to the new DIPAD courses was in this sense in discord with the type of values within art schools. Taylor's comments point to a sort of rift between the wider educational system and art schools. By 1971, the year I was born, um, Taylor felt so opposed to polytechnic scheme that he resigned in protest. And this is from an article in The Guardian in 1971. He resigned against the way in which education in art and design was being organised at Leeds and other polytechnics. He believed education in fine art and education in design should move closer together, but the polytechnics were putting them into separate departments and were supported in this policy by the Coldstream report of last year. All this runs counter to what Mr Taylor preached and practised when he was principal of Leeds College of Art, which gained an international reputation for teaching for its teaching methods. In October of 1971, Taylor joined Norman Adams in a discussion which was printed in The Guardian titled Murder in the Art Schools. And it was regarding the demise of provincial art schools. Adams, like Taylor, and for the same reasons, had just recently resigned from his role as head of the School of Painting at Manchester College of Art. Adams reflected upon the early days of the Dip AD, which he said provided an education to understand the principles of structure in order to be able to invent one's own structures. He then goes on to describe how the department that he worked was recently integrated to fit the monstrous vision of the bureaucrats. Taylor continues the discussion, reinforcing the view that art schools are unique places within the education system and deserve protecting. Once again, Taylor campaigns for art school sovereignty. This is quoted from um, the, uh, the article I referred to earlier. There are few enough artists already of any caliber who can advise. And the latest resignations could mean not only complete separation of art and design, but the gradual demise of all fine art departments, not only in polytechnics, but everywhere in the country. And yesterday we were leading the world. I'll, um, that's that's the end of the the extract, if you like, from from a paper I wrote um, a, a while, little while ago. Um, you're looking at um, the Vernon Street um, site of Leeds College of Arts. So this is the original building, if you like, mm. uh, built in, uh, in 1903. I think Sharon might be able to help me out here. I think the mosaic we're looking at was that was that Taylor. Yeah. I thought it was. Um, and this one is a, a recent uh, acquisition, maybe, um, or, or is it just... Um, it was donated to donated. It was from the Marion Centre in Leeds, mm. and when they've mm. been in the mm. process of taking it down. Oh, right. So this has moved recently, and it was mm. last year, September 2015. So this was a triptych, if you like, uh, three mosaics from the Marion Centre. These, these mosaics were designed by um, uh, Taylor, and uh, this is on... Um, the Jaffer Kramer, formerly Jaffer Kramer site, which um, was built in 1985, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, yeah, it's uh, it appears there. I just thought it was a nice yeah. kind of link. Um, so yeah. it's sort of intrinsic to yeah. some of the vision still, some of the values um, that's still there. Yeah. So interesting. That's yeah. I thought it, there's some interesting yeah. things that Taylor was saying mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm about you know you, you mentioned um different aspects that were important to the training and you know the, the the link between architecture and design and fine art and the closeness of, mm. of everything there mm. um and taylor's values yeah, um absolutely. which were interesting yeah. thank you Jenny. that's uh, that's certainly brought us brought us up to date um <laughs> a bit more. and, and I'm grateful for that. I didn't. I, you know, I wasn't even mm. aware of that. That's that's really mm. interesting. Yeah, that's they're, they're quite super. large as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They? Yeah, yeah.
Terrific. You know more about, about the imagery? I don't actually. I don't. Um, I know that the, the students um, at the college, the, in the fine art departments, the photography departments, um, some students are involved in the restoration. Some students just like to document um, this, this public art which was moved from the 50s at the Marion Centre, I think, to, mm. you know, mm. um, to the college then. Well, yeah. what's interesting is so they were in restoration for nearly mm. a year mm. at great cost. Nobody will say how much. <laughs> um, but knowing the sort of from Tony's mm. talk and that element of skills, mm. you know, that skill base of restoring a landscape like that, you know, there's no way we have anybody in the institution mm. that would have those skills. They will have that mm. craft making, mm. and I know it's not something that is taught realistically anyway. I, I think, and I think that's what's interesting from the time when Mary Martin Thomas was being taught, because there would have been a balance within the staff of York School of Art then, mm. um, specialists supported by craftsmen mm. and I use that word particularly because they invariably were craftsmen um, who acted as craftsmen stroke instructors and they in some cases would actually outnumber the fully paid art lecturing staff mm. at the time. See now that's kind of subverted we've got what you call technicians mm. and workshop staff Mm. which support um, mm. lecturers, uh, they are called workshop technicians and there's, there's a real split between that mm. and academic mm. staff yeah, yeah. and of course the technicians are completely outnumbered sure, sure. Um, yeah. by the academic staff. I mean it, if you look at the work of that's downstairs and some of the photographs that accompany the exhibitions downstairs you, you'll see just what from the regional art schools particularly just what some of the expectations were of the students yeah. in terms of their grasp of those particular skills. Mm. So they mm. came away with a language of skills, a working vocabulary, um, which I think is, is interesting in terms of defining what we mean by art school educating. Mm. I mean, I'll just, you know, I can't profess to be anywhere near as high tech as you are today. I'm very low tech today. As, right, you can, low tech. as you can see, low, low tech is good. On trend at the um, but I, I just, I'll pass these around just so that you can get a sense of some of the shifts in thinking. That I, I'll hold that up. I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but I'll pass it around. Mm. Yeah, that example of those children drawing a leaf from a blackboard is what at that time was called free arm drawing. <laughs> and in fact their success was measured on the basis of how accurate they could be in copying the teacher's illustration of a leaf on the blackboard. You see Tony I really liked that term of visual it mm -hmm. and I think that perhaps mm -hmm. is, is what you're talking about there really or, or what is depicted in that photograph yeah, yeah. of being visual it was it's just as important as being literate and you know mm. and having numeracy absolutely so. um, there's another one which follows on from that and again what I find interesting is the actual construction mm. of the room itself this is Manchester School of Art mm. right and this is about the same well give it give it about 10 years about 1910 and of course a lot of the drawing and design practice was on blackboards mm. with chalk mm. So like the children there and the teachers on this particular training course here, these student teachers, right? there was no end record of the undertaking because it would simply be wiped off, it would be erased. Um, but a lot of the practice went on on boards at that time. Um, Are they drawing rules? No. They've the got the backs to it. I, 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 yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the, what the, what the task is, Roger. Um, uh, there's one that's coming around. This is uh, young ladies from exactly Mary Martin Thomas's period. This is about 1930 from the modelling school putting up their final display. Mm. So they would be expected to understand how to model in low relief and in three dimensions. And if I send that one around that way, that's 
modeling in three dimensions from the same period. You can do it with your hand in your pocket. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But of course, that first that first picture that went round of the children who were doing that freehand drawing, yeah, it was only with the advent of the what was called the alternative syllabus in 1895, which was put in place by somebody called James Sully, that drawing was part of the expectations of children in the school anyway. But it wasn't called drawing then. Imagine this. This is straight out of Dickens. It was called rendering with accuracy <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit daunting as a subject isn't it straight out of do the boys hall um, and the last one that's coming around is of a painting group from i think it's late 40s um i can't identify the school of art but you'll recognize the the situation and the conditions um just while some of those are going around i've pulled out from the archive itself. Um, uh, three, oh, I'm okay, that's it, I'm fine, thank you. Three examples, because they are of the period and they illustrate not only one of the key collections that we've got, but they give an indication of the level of expectation in terms of graphic skills, in terms of handling pattern and handling design, and they're all, these three anyway, are from the A.E. Halliwell collection. Halliwell himself was employed by William Johnson at Camberwell School in the late 30s to set up the first industrial design course. Um, and bear in mind that these are pre-computer days, pre-computer images. So the actual design and layout and setup of these would in a sense echo in many ways the sorts of things that students would be expected to do at the time um, and encapsulated particularly incidentally he went on with Halliwell to run the three-dimensional course at Central School of Art a bit later on um, but in terms of an understanding of design and lettering and layout, as well as color and balance of image, there's another example of um, Halliwell's work, as is this final one, which sort of brings together something of the adventure of the time and you know, the experimental nature of design work during that period and I think that's a that's a clever mm -hmm. uh, advertisement for cricket at Lords. Mm -hmm. um, but of course we have an embarrassment of riches in terms of this collection um, this is one of dozens of examples of Halliwell's work and of that particular design mm -hmm. course so if you see that in that sense those yeah. were the expectations and they would have been replicated by students at the time mm -hmm. for that particular element of their course in the same way that the three-dimensional low relief and um, and modeling courses would have been another component of the courses that were operating at that particular yeah. period well perhaps a little bit about the contemporary yeah. um, syllabus um, just thinking about those um, advertisements um, the students at Leeds College of Art, they do s what you call scamps in terms of qu very quick drawings of their creative ideas for advertisements and it's creative advertisements and I think there's a distinct difference between general advertisements and creative advertisements but they, they do have a, um, a freelance a visualer who comes in and helps them to visualise um, their ideas but they do have to do it very quickly because in industry you have to do it very quickly as an art director or copywriter you quickly just have your idea visualized and then you hand that over uh, if it's if it's a good idea uh, or, the, or the best idea out of a group um, it will then go on to someone that works as an art worker and they work on apple max on max mm. and they will mac it up 
using the software of InDesign, Photoshop, um, or you know whatever the software they need, um, and those are very distinct, um, different skills. Mm. Um, but they they are skilled, as it were, um, the, the art workers using those um, um, acrylics. Mm. But um, so they those hand skills mm. are not in the curriculum anymore mm. for advertising. But having said that, the visual the, the drawing is the the visualization in perspective in proportion of of where whichever screen or whether it's on a large scale the proportion is there and then on the course itself um students on occasion have to mac it up themselves so they have workshops with technicians um in the mac suite environment and they're told how to you know they're, they're instructed how to um, uh, visualize and uh, render their their idea, but using software mm. and photography sometimes. And sometimes they work in collaboration with the photography students, particularly on competition work, to get it to the best, uh, you know, um, execution that they can. Mm. But you know, those those hand skills. Mm. That students have gone. Although some some students take um, some students really, um, and we do support them with this. They do like to develop their drawing skills, and we do support them with that. Particularly mm. with the um, it's called Pete Denton. He comes in and, and helps them visualize their ideas. Mm. Mm. Um, but some students focus on that. Mm. But yeah, so that's no. that's kind of a, a contemporary. Sort of I think that's very <laughs> interesting. I think mm. I I in one mm. sense, with you know, okay. with the, with the course that we're looking at from the 1920s into the 1930s, um, you know, the skills are clearly delineated. Yeah. You know, that's the expectation. That's the package that you buy into. Yeah. Uh, that informs your training yeah. and your development, and along with that comes another expectation which is that you should know about things you should know about the techniques you should know about the processes you should know about the art architecture and historical references that yeah. inform those particular yeah. elements of your course yeah so so that it, there's a, a clear definition of, of, of knowledge craft yeah. skills design skills and then you know I suppose the confidence to execute those to good effect yeah I mean there is we call them modules now yeah. there is modules on yeah. context of practice and they through that um, part of it is to become very visually literate to understand the histories of mm. signs and mm. signification and where that's come from um, so that is mm. still on the syllabus you know to have a good knowledge of, yeah. of art yeah. and design history yeah, yeah, that's sure. that's still there Mm. Um, and you know talking about the technical skills they have to learn how to work with sound and on in the edit suite they have to be able to work with video and vines and all sorts of you know online sort of versions of you know visual mm. culture mm. Um, but it's just a different type of process I suppose what's interesting mm. to add on to that so the piece that I'll talk briefly about is um, I run the short courses at the college and many of the undergraduates will then join my short courses to learn the skills right. and so then there's that yeah. huge leap so yeah. sadly we're about to lose our life drawing room we've fought many years to have a life drawing room I've had it for <laughs> two and a half years and I'm about to lose oh. it this summer and so yeah. that seems a, a ludicrousness to have an art school having seen those beautiful drawings mm. where we don't have a life studio mm. that life drawing isn't intrinsic mm. Mm. within the curriculum so that's, so that's visual, visual yeah, yeah, yeah. that mm. notion of what it is to yes, look yeah, yeah. to think to record right. and that's you know that's not an embodied in the learning mm. Mm. yeah I can see how that yeah I can see how that, that will be a real concern um, Mm, okay, but I, 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 I don't want to take up you know, any extra time, but give other folks an opportunity to, to, to comment. It, the one thing I'd just like to 
check with you before we move on to that. Yeah, and I'm going, I'm going right back to sort of 1911 now, and Royal College in 1911, Roger. What are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> because you're in the firing line. <laughs> you thought I went there. <laughs> I know, I know. You've got associations everywhere. Um, but at that time, in 1911, it's. Uh, and I only I only co uncovered this this piece of evidence the other day. In a period of ten years, um, the Royal College um, had four hundred and fifty nine graduate students, and out of that four hundred and fifty nine, only thirty two made the practice of art in any form their livelihood. When you think of that as a percentage, then. That's a very low percentage. I don't know how things stand at the moment in terms of employment prospects or yeah. in terms of taking what they know mm. from your course into the wider world yeah, well and how successful you are at yeah, in I supporting mean, them there. I'm not sure it's a college-wide figure, um, but I know we've got something like between 80 and 90%. It's a very, the course of creative advertising is a very vocationally focused course and it's looking at a career of working in a creative department within a creatively led agency. So it's very niche. Mm. And it's, it's, a very, it's a specialist course within a specialist art school. Um, and, they, you know, and they've got lots of industry links. So it's, and the, 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 my, my colleagues are from industry. Mm. Um, and then the, you know, the, they've come into art education later. Um, but it's it's very vocationally focused, mm. and I think it has to be mm. to a point, really. Um, particularly with the fees coming in and parents, just this is it's an interesting change now. The, mm. the fees have come in gradually, phased in, but now you know the, the students are paying full full fees, and there's mm. a lot of consideration of where they're going to invest. Mm. Um, in rich higher education institutes and mm. where they're going to do their arts and design degree mm. Mm. Um, and they are thinking about even you know when they're choosing they're thinking about career prospects etc mm. perhaps I mean but that's that's in the context of creative advertising mm. so. mm. I think the notion of like, negotiable skills then and now is still a, a, a pertinent aspect of, of any course isn't it definitely and i know that some of the students haven't gone into creative advertising but they've gone into a related communications industry they've gone mm. into you know film and media mm. Mm. Yeah. so they're kind of transferable creative yeah, skills sure or even the games industry some of them right, have gone right it's interesting but thank you mm. anybody else have any thoughts or observations roger Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, um, I just want to sort of give another context because one of what questions, because I've seen the same way that Tony has posed a question, art school educated, and we'll also to the opportunity to pose a question when we have a discussion shortly um, as to whether the art place can be a place for lifelong learning. Um, and my reason for this, this will be comparing. I've been fortunate to be a lifelong learner. I was the first person in my family to attend university with the aid of the grant scheme in the 1980s. Um, but I did a law degree because I thought that was the way you got a job. Uh, not that I've ever practiced. Um, but the opportunity to retrain was uh, there because of the excellent provision we had for further education for adults in the late 90s. Um, and so I was able to fulfill my teenage dream to go on to art school. Now that's something that's in demise at the moment and I feel in the present government yes they're pushing for apprenticeships and they are saying that there is an opportunity to move forward to part-time learning but often people feel that part-time learning is maybe not fit for an art school setting and for instance if Mary Martha Thomas would have worked would have been full-time but we know that different formats throughout the last century mm. have offered part-time mode. So my role at East College of Art uh, began, actually, I was the course leader for the HMC Millinery Programme for nine years, which was a part-time level four course, mainly adult learners, a um, mix of graduates wanting new artisan skills that they hadn't got on their undergraduate programme, and students who had never thought they could get into education, 
that education wasn't the right place for them. But because of the nature of the skills learned, the way it was taught, giving a confidence, etc., enabled them to see they could. Many went on to do uh, further undergraduate study and went into employment setting up their own businesses. So it was a different form of programme than we offer now as our undergraduate programme. Sadly, the Institute chose to close that craft-based skill because of the way they saw their strategy going in 2013. Um, so short course manager, my aim is often to dispel the myth that the, of the art school, that notion that creativity is innate and only the select few are allowed through our doors. And we're all fortunate, we are all here, we will have had some level of background in art, design, education, but maybe we forget that many are still feared by that. Um, and so I look at the idea of, you know, how do you engage people who maybe are an accountant by day, but have actually been totally been, dis, you know, inspired by the pottery throwdown to have a go at ceramics. Our figures leaped up last year and we had that program on the TV. Um, or as a place to rekindle past dreams. Last year we offered 300 adult, adult courses. None of them are accredited. Um, we worked with over 3,000 students from breadth. So people who are artist practitioners who want to share their knowledge, share their skills, um, through to people who went, oh, actually, what's it like to use an industrial sewing machine? I don't know. Um, and these are people that continue, and it's a community. You know, they aren't all Leeds-based. They are usually from West Yorkshire or the wider field, but we have people coming over from the Northwest because we're offering skills they can't get anywhere else. So things like our jewellery workshops, there's nobody else offering those kind of skills. And it is that you know, visual literacy that we know was taught then but it's often not taught in our undergraduate programmes now. So why am I talking about this today? Obviously, it's a slight hobby horse, as you might guess. Um, in 1998, the Learning Age Green People at Paper was published. Oh, I've got a nice picture, I think. Of that's, this is our ceramic studio. Um, David Blunkett recently stated the paper as a piece of work that he was most proud of. Um, his, the real aim was of the Green Paper to um, create learning to be lifelong and that the need to embed learning in the cultural society and communities was imperative. Um, as I've just said, we all maybe see that, we know that that's the case, but to a wider community, it's often forgotten and often the reality that it's difficult to access this breadth of opportunities. Um, David Hughes, who's the new CEO of Learning and Work Institute, which is a merger of um, NIACE and um, a Centre for Economic and Social Inclusion, has noted that Many of the ambitions set out in the report were just unfulfilled. And currently, the RSA, the Royal Society of Art and Design Practitioners, is looking at presenting a paper to uh, the new city mayor to highlight the need for the 21st century to address this currency of lifelong careers, lifelong education. We know we don't have a job for life. The labour market is constantly shifting, and education has to support that. And the current undergraduate programme, and we, we offer really exciting undergraduate degrees, I feel, mm. at Leeds College of Art, and they do give people the skills to go into the workplace. But as if I myself wanted to retrain now, well, the loan would terrify me, uh, and the nature of going back working full time would be really, you know, wouldn't be opportunistic. And our institutions are measured on their output, so they're measured on the completion. They don't get the monies if people don't stay. Whereas most part-time students are constantly impacted by change, you know, what's happening in their day-to-day -day life, they've suddenly got to care for somebody. So how can we as an education provider offer something that's an alternate to that? Um, so as I said, we did offer part-time programmes um, for millinery close 2013, we offered a BA Fine Art programme, um, that finished in 2014, as did a part-time access course. So currently, the only opportunity for people to just try or come in and do a part-time provision is through short courses. Now, I see that's a great opportunity for us to do. I've looked at Edinburgh College of Art, and they also offer a similar provision, and they're accredited. They can build up credit units, which I feel is a, is a great chance for us to reframe what we do. At the moment, people think that, oh, they're just leisure courses. People just come and throw a few pots, or they come and make up a skirt, whereas actual fact, their skills that are imperative to offer people new opportunities to share and shape um, their lives, be it to change their career, careers, be it to engage their students, their children, or, or, or you know, to offer a sense of fulfilment. So I guess my question is, how can we now look at offering an effective accreditation system 
to be developed. Maybe it's something like digital badges where people pick the information up as they go along. Um, do people have individual learning accounts, which was something that was uh, played around with by the Labour government, uh, where learners build credits with their opportunities and their engagements for learning. I think the art school has the flexibility to do this, but we have to be maybe quite subversive in challenging what's happening in the marketplace at the moment to see how we can go forward. Um, I mean, I just sort of put a few images up. You see, they're, they're skills based, you know, and it's often something that isn't happening if I go around the college during mm. the day. Mm. You know, yes, say in the fashion department, they are very pertinent to skills, but often it's a much faster skill, whereas we're working at, you know, really nitty gritty. And there's a shared learning. Um, so I think this, these aren't, neither of these two are students. They're constantly teaching each other. And we often forget the joy of that. And we know that that's that constant passing on of learning. And I think that the programs that we offer enable that sort of format. Uh, Jewelry, my tu this is my tutor with a very flamboyant earring. Sometimes I think she's a bit of a, a, a hazard when she's in there with the jewellery. <laughs> but again, it's a shared process. These people come back continually, not just for the equi equipment, but to share the learning, to share the skills. And you know, the tutor will often be learning from the student uh, and it's very, very much empowering. And our students will range from 18 to in their 90s. In fact, currently we have a, a, one of our students on our life classes was a student at the college in the 1930s. And so he recently came to a celebration we had because we're 170 years old. I can't remember that. This Get year. That <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing we also do is I run young creative courses. So we set up young creatives courses for children from the age of seven three years ago. Um, I, we noticed there's a massive loss in the curriculum mm. and many of the students that come to us are not doing any art and design mm. within their day to day at school. Um, they come on Saturdays and we do holiday sessions as well. So we run, we're running three weeks in the summer. But our aim is that every child has the potential to be an artist. You know, there's no rules, there's no regulations. We engage, we ask questions, they work together, they design together. And this has a model to go forward. Often funding is a, is a problem. We do offer a lot of bursaries here for, to engage our, a wider audience. Um, but these are my, I'm throwing out questions. And I think there's a lot more discussion. It'd be interesting to look at the RSA paper as to where we could go forward with opportunities within the art school. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I think. Yeah, can I just ask you a question? Yes. Would Mary Martin Thomas have actually played any theme? In those days, were, were, were there themes? No. Yes, it was something else. No, not, not, not as such. The, there, w there would have been money that would have been devolved for the students. I think in, in, in her case, it would have been something like five pounds. I can't remember for how much of her course. But, like the, you mean there would be bursaries but there would be bursaries scholarship and scholarships. Yeah. That's right. The fees in the way that we know them today didn't exist in, in that sense. I mean, you know, they were very much uh, su supported by you know, small scholarships and so on. Um, so that's the big change, yeah. really. And, it, and even some of the trade schools there, I think. Uh, Somewhere in, in my notes there's actually a breakdown of um, what the charges were for the trade schools and it, it went depending on where you were and what you were doing. It was a, a shilling for some course and then it went up to one and six for another type of course. Um, uh, and that in itself is, is, is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Jenny, for that. Roger, you, you had something to say. A lifetime ago. <laughs> a lifetime ago. No, it's just a very cool thing. Who actually devises your courses? <laughs> yours are full time, yours are part time, basically, aren't they? That you're um, talking about. I devise the part time. Yeah, I'm fortunate I have that opportunity. So you've got the, a total free hand. I've just got to make sure I make money. <laughs> right. And what about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Is it I think. Upon you or? Um, it's an interesting question because very recently, um, unfortunately, we lost some of the craft courses, um, and the furniture course was a big. So big when one you say go. you lost them, yeah. who took that decision? Yeah. Senior management. Senior, senior management took that management. decision. However, right. that and it was, was financial. Coupled, yeah, it was financial reasons. Right. Um, however, there was a call out for other ideas. So then academics put 
their ideas forward, but then senior management judge when whether this is viable. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, p uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, practice based or or you know academic based mm -hmm. um, lecturers that work at the college that more. Uh, th those that are involved in curriculum design, probably from senior lecturer, principal upwards. But we're looking to expand our courses because yes. we're going to have a new build in 2018. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. design of those new courses actually can, they've employed a consultant to come in, mm -hmm. have conversations with member of staff and to go away and then come back and present ideas of what we need to meet mm -hmm. the, the perceived future. Mm -hmm. And the consultant will be... What skills? What uh, skills? Good question. Yeah, it's a good question because obviously there needs mm. to be business skills, there needs to be, mm. and also um, it may be industrial skills. But I know recently we've been through some revalidations, so that's when um, a, a, a panel judge whether a course is relevant to mm. carry on. Um, and we've, we've there's an undergraduate, there was a four yesterday, Sharon. So I was involved in a revalidation of a course. And it's the programme leader that puts forward their vision um, of the course. So, th And that mm -hmm. vision, then you get your course objectives and then you get all your modules. So it's, it's the, you know, the, the course, the managers really of the courses yeah. that, um, but then it has to ultimately get approval from senior management, yeah. which aren't, nece aren't necessarily, but a lot are, um, from an art and design background. Yeah. Um, but in the, you know, a good percentage of the, the directors that are. Unlike the 1920s of course Roger where the, the actual structure of the course will be externally set yes, by the, by the, the Board of Education yeah. uh, and then validated uh, aspects of it validated mm. by local examination boards. Um, Presumably there's still an element of that in terms of the, the modules and the examinations and the, mm. you know, whatever you achieve at the end. Yeah, it's we're in a flux because currently the we're managed. Our degrees are accredited Valid by Open yeah. University, whereas we're just going through um, process. a process of going into te to, to being get to be a university mm. to have mm. teaching our own mm. uh, awarded. Because in the, in the, the the short extracts that I I read, the Leeds College of Art was split. Um, part of the higher education went to uh, the Polytechnic. And Leeds College of Art retained only the further education for yeah. a while. Mm -hmm. And then in 2011, they were awarded once again higher education institutes. Um, but we haven't got our own validating powers yet. But we're just on the cusp of finding out, probably in the next, next month, I think. Next yeah. month. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's, it's all in a flux, isn't Good. it? It's all it dynamic. Is. It um, is. Thank you for that. Can I just ask you for yes. Just when you were Catherine. saying about your, your course, I mean, how, what's the in terms of how many courses are both machine driven yeah. and uh, to kind of keep up with demands in terms of industry and yeah. changing kind of work force and all things like that, you know, so, so that some courses might be deemed as redundant or obsolete. I don't know whether life drawing is kind of a part of that kind of, um, you know, I kind of sense of, of things. Yeah. I'm, I'm just interested how, in mm. terms of the diversity of courses that are on offer, how many are kind of very much kind of keyed into you know, the, I don't know, you've heard it's skill set, so there's mm. a government organisation that highlights the skills that are needed for industry and they can award mm. accreditation to programmes to say that they are um, that way. And so our graphic design degree is a skill set accredited uh, programme, as is our national extended diploma, which deals with graphic design, which is taught for 16 to 18 year olds. So they are deemed industry standard. Mm. Yours was mm. We're going through the Your process. And creative advertising is going through the process. Mm. Our courses do lots of external projects. So our um, printed textiles degree, they're very high with regards to winning awards mm. um, within a lot of different textile mm. competitions mm. and industry standards. So we know they have those skills mm. and fashion do as well. So it's there a are some percent, elements a large of that. Yeah, the the There's a fine the art is expanding. Well, the fine art, I mean, fine art the fine art is, I suppose, it is a vocation <laughs> still, um, but it's actually the full time course is expanding and it's one of, it's it's biggest, one the of our biggest recruiters. It's becoming, mm. fine art yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've got 110 and only first years this year. Only about that was eight years ago, it was only, was it part time? It was part time. 
so how does that match mm. with what you were saying about fees and pressures on you know mm. kind of students making decisions as to what their investments can return and mm. having different well, I think we were interested because you didn't know you didn't know whether fine art figures were suddenly going to plummet with the 9,000 fees but and actually they went up they went up <laughs> And actually, sector-wise, yeah, yeah. fine art <laughs> numbers increased. Mm. Um, so that notion that we might have had, or maybe it helped because you had people like, is it the money-saving experts saying, don't worry, if you're going to be a fine artist, you'll never have to pay them back because you'll never earn more than 21,000. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, sort of a, that's a tricky one. <laughs> and so, Sharon, do your courses, do you know, you made that distinction with them being the not leisure courses. Do you, would you offer like a short course that would be kind of like CC or full time course that was advertised? Is, is, is it not the equivalent of what would be offered on a full time but, but, but on no. a part time basis? Are I've tried. Yeah. I've tried, but senior management aren't quite keen on it yet. But that would be an aspiration, I think, because there are a lot of people who would enjoy that level of uh, critical analysis mm. that occurs mm. in the undergraduate programmes. Mm. Um, do, do you know? Roger. Do you <laughs> Do you know what the curriculum is in the fine art course these days? Uh, after is a fashion. I, d I don't, because I don't, I don't teach on it, so yeah. I, so no, I don't. But um, that's interesting. It's open, yeah. isn't it? Mm. Yes, I, it I is. I teach um, oh, fine art courses. Oh, I'm, a, what's, what's um, I'm a leader in fine art at Sheffield Academy. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I can't say our curriculum is standard to anyone else's, mm. but I mean, I've worked in fine art education for a long time. So what, what, what is taught in Sheffield? When, okay, when you say curriculum, I mean, I can sadly talk about module structures, but um, <laughs> I find all that stuff... What do the students do? <laughs> yes, thank you. That, that is how I'd rather talk, and that's how I sort of develop the teaching, too. Um, the, the students largely spend time making and learning through a self-directed process of making and critical questioning. And the teaching is very in our department is very much seen as a way to support that, to inform that, and to question it. Um, and part of that questioning is theoretical questioning. So the statements you read out, I'm my students would have this, this understood. Oh, well, some of them, not all of them, because students yeah. are all very different, and not well, all what students what get involved philosophically. But many artists yeah. nowadays do, um, and and they have lectures. But those lectures are kept. We see the lectures as very important, and the art staff deliver them um, around context, history, um, and also contemporary practice. But we try, whilst we think they're really important, we try not to encumber the students' week with them because most of the students, but not all, do like to get into a, a different labour dimension, shall we say, in terms of being able to think and make their work. So we don't want to crisscross that with <laughs> demands to be in lots of different places <coughs> for different reasons. And, and actually, um, whilst we are quite theoretically driven and see that as very important to making, um, we really encourage life drawing. So we're, we're beginning a conversation about the importance of how it doesn't have to be one or the other and that you know, vis visual skills are really important. So I work with a crit group and I make them do a lot of observational drawing as well as challenge them conceptually, and they love being tasked to keep an observational sketchbook, which I found really quite curious. And the life drawing room isn't full of every student, but there's always a group of students who weekly go down to the life room, and this is a really important part of their mm. study. Their mm. end work isn't always life drawings, and I find that really interesting as well, the mm. sort of changing role of mm. a life... And I think a life room is essential. This is, I think, like Winchester School of Art, they have a permanent life room and a permanent technician in the life room. So students can go and use it at any point from half past eight in the morning till seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. And it, it's, it's imperative because it's part of their practice. And, and other areas can use the life room too. Yeah. I mean, mm. that, you know, we sh that's, there's something quite wonderful about having this mm. facility. And they're also beautiful mm. places. And I think that's important, the environment that different courses can feed into and also provision of evening courses. Mm as well. Mm. What about other, um, other skills in terms of making? Is there any kind of part of the curriculum? That That's a really contentious issue. Um, I wish there were more sort of taught making skills and I think I think most of the students yearn for that mm. in a way. So they do have workshops and some of those are quite making intensive. 
where, whether they become really eloquent in certain skills. I suppose our, a lot of that's about resources and all that stuff, if I'm honest. And then some of it's about course philosophies. Um, what we would hope is that we can give the student enough so that those who want to really develop work through a making-based approach and developing a skill set have enough knowledge from a few workshops to then carry on and self-direct within the technical workshops because the students have access to really fantastic technical facilities at the university. They're not always near the studio, so personally I don't think that's a problem. And what, um, what kind of level of, um, in terms of what you're saying about technicians, work mm. technicians, how, um, what's their kind of calibre or skill level? To, are, are, they, are they teaching or are they just kind of, um, I don't know, helping? I think ours are Jazz practitioners, practitioners usually, well. and they're teaching. Mm. So, well, we wouldn't yeah. use the word teaching. What, what is it? Facilitating. Only facilitate. Well, uh, that's only sort of like contract of employment yes. and it's awful mm. because mm. I suppose it's back to that definition again, what's teaching, what's learning or whatever, but they are constantly engaging and any feedback we always get is the workshop technicians are phenomenal. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Really important, but they're really mm. over pressured and yeah. Yeah. Which compromises their job, but um, yeah, mm. our students gain a lot around the edges of the technical mm. facilitation. They, because a lot of the technicians are practitioners, so there's these other conversations that happen that are invaluable, mm. but aren't explicitly recognised in the contract. Mm. Yeah. You've twice mentioned self-direction, mm. uh, and can I ask if this applies in Leeds as well? Mm. Do you have? A I don't know, your tutors, whoever are keeping an eye on the students, are they mentoring them sufficiently so they don't become little lost souls with uh, with no goals? Because mm -hmm. I think self-direction is a, is a big demand on mm -hmm. some students. So mm -hmm. They go from the structure of uh, secondary education and into this, they are, get on with it. How do, how do you cope with that? Mm -hmm. and but, but do you ever find it a problem with your mm -hmm. students? It, that's a really, really key question and that gets more and more um, important as the schooling system that our students are coming from Change. Sort of becomes more um, instructional. instructional, thank you, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, you go by the schedule, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we've had to change our teaching methods actually, particularly in that first year to really try and help and facilitate that process of becoming a self-directed learner. But at Sheffield Hallow, I mean, we sort of feel that's crucial, that if a student doesn't find their own way to do that, with our help, of course, um, then they're not really going to be able to flourish in terms of fine art, because mm. one of the key things about being a fine artist is, is that no one's asked you to do it. You know, some of our most amazing artworks and paintings aren't there because there was an industry need or Mm -hmm. jobs needed supplying or a specifically socially recognised problem needing sol mm -hmm. needed solving, although artworks, artists can contribute there. Uh, they sort of come out of, you know, a, a certain type of reflection which can be very personal or can be incredibly um, political or philosophical. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you get that sort of creative um, contribution to the whole mix of cultural things that humans do unless you have that self-direction. But it's hugely complicated and students struggle. I, I find that really painful to see and all we can do is try our best to um, mm. work with students in, in lots of ways. I don't think there's a prescribed way you can do that, mm. actually, and it comes down to a lot of the importance of artist to artist tut tut yeah. um, tutorials. And mm. I think that's a the importance of that will never go away, even if the mm. hours allocated mm. to it keep going down and down. That's right. So I suppose it does depend on what discipline. Um, it can depend on which discipline, but even in the creative advertising, if they end up being you know, employed in the creative advertising studio, to be successful, they need to maintain their own practice alongside working on um, you know, uh, briefs, creative briefs they'll get from clients in order to be an exciting creative, you need to have your own practice. They'll need to be self-directed yes. mm. at the yes. same time. Mm. So that self-practice, mm. it's, it's kind of, it's what they do. It's, it's as an artist or a creator, you can't help 
being creative um, and it's it's that kind of you know not innate but it's it's that's that's what's kind of um, nurtured I suppose through the art school Janine on that I'm sorry but we're gonna have to we're gonna have to hold it there uh, Catherine can I just ask one final one? if it's yeah, quick I can't go really. it's like, um, just what you were saying about the critical the course being that balance of critical theory and thinking they kind of make and how they feed into each other I mean my, yeah. my I've never worked in, in a, in a teaching institution um, as, uh, you know in a, on a program but it seems to me that the courses are much more kind of critically led now and they're making yeah. uh, that it's as compared to historically yeah but but what you were saying that your course is really popular undergraduates you know there seems and what you was just saying there about that that they're hungry for those instruction on particular skills I mean do you think it's gone too far or do you think there's I don't know I'm just thinking that you know, it seems much. There seem much more academic courses now. So even fight, you know, kind of art courses are very academic and very challenging and demanding on young people's academic skills. So people would have opted for art school 20, 30 years ago because they enjoy making and they enjoy that physical production of things. That that opportunity is kind of not so kind of present anymore. The, the kind of there's lots of different things that I think impact that because one of the big things is our numbers so the demands we have on numbers like you said before you know fine art five years ago was a uh, average cohort of maybe 30 a year whereas now we're 110 moving up to 120 so there's a con you know and everybody would have had their own studio space and they're, they're fortunate at Sheffield to have their own studio space well mm. theoretically yes it only works because so many students don't come in or use the studio space and so those that really mm. need one get one. So we know that our mm. students have our courses are space hungry. Mm. So then you suddenly find senior management will make decisions where courses are maybe not so space hungry mm. we might get a bit more of an edge. So the demand mm. for practice is big, isn't it? You know, if you want to work large mm. you need quite a bit of space. So this mm. often it's those um, organizational things that impact what's taught. It's just, it's just we've seen a lot of secondary school and primary school children who enjoy art because it's a making activity and then and it seems as if the secondary education has not changed to match what's happening in higher education so there's that disconnect between what's what children experience mm -hmm. at school in terms of enjoying making art well, it's, it's a lot of mm -hmm. non-academic children who really enjoy art well, I and think then they want to go to art school and it's kind of an well academic what, subject. What, ta what Taylor was suggesting to be visual is academic mm. <laughs> it's that dichotomy between theory being academic and making non-academic mm. it's not you it's you know that it's it's um making, but it's yeah it's i'm just wondering if it's gone too far that the children don't uh, the young people don't have the opportunity to 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 make and explore materials i think in, in schools as much definitely as much as definitely as in schools could or want to or yeah. Catherine, Catherine, Jean, sorry can, can i just suggest that probably be a good idea if we continue this discussion downstairs um, I'd like to thank Janine and Sharon for, for your contribution this afternoon and for opening up a whole range of other thoughts mm -hmm. about, uh, about provision and, and teaching and training as it is at Leeds right now and that's, that's really interesting and contributions from everybody else yeah. from around the table thank you for that I think that's certainly made me think about all sorts of things and uh, to revise some of you know my views and position on on a, on a lot of those I, I think the best thing we can do is, is if I could invite you all just to join us downstairs for some refreshments now um, and share a few ideas and continue this discussion downstairs in the context of Mary Martin Thomas's exhibition which stands as a snapshot of history she has her place, as does that course, and it gives us, I think, an interesting hook mm. to hang some of the, the day's discussions on. Yeah. And I hope that partly that you enjoy the exhibition, but partly that it actually does alert you to some of the conditions and hopes and aspirations that she carried with her at that time in the 1920s. But thank you all very much thank for you. your time. Thank you. Thank you.